Hey everyone, Chris here with another filler video. So I had a pretty interesting filler lined up for this week, but I didn't have enough time to get it together. So instead, I put it to a vote as to what to talk about, and the vote suggested some Windows 3.1 stuff. So to that end, we're taking a quick look at one of my favorite Windows 3.1 games, which <laughs> admittedly I haven't played in many years now, Warpath. Warpath was originally created and released by Dan Samuel in 1994 under his then new company name Synthetic Reality. Now, if that company name sounds familiar, then you may indeed be familiar with another game they made, which was far more popular back around the turn of the century called Well of Souls, which was sort of an MMO, though it still used traditional server hosting and such, and could still be played solo if desired. And even to this day, there are people out there who still play it. But as for Warpath, at first glance, it's hard to know if it's a space exploration game, a strategy game, or both. And the shorter answer is, well, kinda neither. Warpath is a game about brute strength. You can get clever and strategic if you want to, but this is probably one of the few games out there where anything but the most basic strategy actually tends to be your undoing, and the ultimate winning formula is just blast your way to victory. Now, one of the interesting claims to fame for this game was its ability to do networked and modem connectivity, back at a time when even DOS games were still trying to dial in that kind of gameplay. So for a Windows 3.1 game to be doing it was kind of unheard of. If you lacked someone to play against though, you could still play it solo against computer opponents. Now, for as fun as Warpath is, it's very much not a perfect game, and there's so many things I would have done differently if I was the one making it. For starters, there's only two empires, the Green Path of Peace and the Red Path of War. So, for a game where more than two people can play, having a fixed requirement of two teams kind of limits the potential gameplay outcomes. Although, as you'll soon see, having multiple teams would have complicated the core gameplay quite a bit. Now when you actually start playing, you'll be pretty weak, with only a single shield installed and barely any power to get anywhere. Now you can raise and lower engine speed using a couple buttons, but when your engines are pushed beyond their normal limit, you lose antimatter fuel. Now there's actually three different gauges, a blue, purple, and yellow gauge. Yellow is resources you mine from planets, purple is your electron energy for weapons and other devices, while blue is your antimatter fuel, which also acts as a health gauge, as if you run out of fuel, you lose a life. There's two ways you earn money in this game. The first and most obvious one is by selling the resources you mine from uninhabited worlds. The amount of money you'll get for resources depends primarily on two factors, how many resources a civilization has, and how much that civilization likes you expressed on a gauge ranging from red to yellow to green, indicating if a planet is aligned with the red or green factions, or if it's neutral and it'll accept assistance from either side. However, selling resources is ultimately small potatoes. The real money is in taxes. Any planet aligned with your side contributes taxes to your ongoing war efforts. A circle in the middle of the screen indicates how long it'll be to the next cycle, along with how many cycles have passed. Each time a new cycle begins, you earn tax money. Needless to say, the more planets and people aligned with you, the more taxes you bring in, and this is ultimately far more profitable than simply selling resources. Now, one thing you can do to expand your empire is colonize other worlds. You pick up extra colonists every time you stop off at a planet aligned with your side, and you can carry up to 1,999 colonists. When you're orbiting a world you want to colonize, you simply press a button and 200 colonists will be dropped off. You can drop off as many colonists as you want, and since colonists on your ship don't contribute to taxes, it's often good to send out as many as you can, unless you have other worlds nearby that you intend to colonize right away. New colonies, though, will be immediately vulnerable to everything, so investing in their infrastructure right away is important. In fact, investing in planets is how you get a neutral planet to join your side. There's six areas you can invest in. Mining, spaceport, industry, agriculture, defense, and education. While these all play a factor in the underlying simulation, chances are high that you'll just want to max out the investment in every one of these as soon as you can, which can be done in just a matter of clicks. Each of these six aspects of planetary development costs 30,000 credits to max out from 0%, so you can fully invest in any planet for 180,000 credits or less, which happens to be a little less than what you would typically get for a max-sized full cargo hold when selling to a planet you just colonized which had no resources left or an immediate desperate need. So yeah, if you can completely mine out a planet to have a full cargo hold, 
then colonize the planet, you'll easily be able to sell the resources back and max out the infrastructure as well. Now, if money does become an issue, you do have the option to take out loans, but quite frankly, I routinely forget this is even a thing, because as long as you're diligent, there'll always be something you could be doing to earn money and make progress. Though one potential strategy is to use loans to get as many neutral planets to your cause as fast as possible, so you can then repay the loans very quickly and have lots of planets on your side post haste. Colonizing space, though, is not the ultimate goal of the game. In fact, this again leads into what I said before, this game's all about brute strength. The ultimate goal is to annihilate the ships of your opponents. Not their empire, just the players leading the empire. Personally, I find this to be kind of a dumb thing. Waltzing into an opponent's territory isn't exactly difficult, and gunning down your opponents can be done pretty easily once you've got a good sense of aiming, even when they're in their own territory. For a lot of reasons, I feel the emphasis of an extra live system and defeating opponents' lives as opposed to taking out the Empire itself can really make the game uninteresting and makes it feel like all that colonizing and investing didn't really serve much of a purpose. To that end, when playing multiplayer with other people, it's good to have some extra rules in place to keep the game from becoming a shooter fest in the first couple minutes. I recommend having a rule that you can only begin attacking each other at the start of a certain attack cycle, such as cycle 15 or 20. That way, players have time to develop and expand their empire and prepare for a much more engaging and interesting bout of combat, beyond it being a really boring shooting match with pathetic weapons which goes on seemingly forever. The one thing which does help to discourage this, though, is a special hard mode. This mode makes the sector barriers red instead of yellow, and crossing one of these red sector barriers will cause serious damage every time. Or if your shields are down, it'll just outright obliterate you. This helps a little, but honestly, it doesn't take long to get max shields and stats if that's what you want to go for, and if you're playing against the AI, these red barriers don't even have an effect on them. Actually, because the AI is often more of a nuisance than an actual threat, I take the approach of seeing how far I can dwindle the opponent empire down before I'm forced to defeat all of their ships. To me, the most successful game is when the entire galaxy is nothing but planets of my color, which kind of sounds oppressive, but is ultimately a lot more challenging than just taking the AI out. One of the things you can do to make this more interesting as well is invest in the more unique equipment available. For instance, you can buy Plague Bombs, which when launched against the planet will start a plague which will slowly kill off the population as the plague gets worse. If not cured, the population will ultimately be wiped out and the plague will disappear with it, leaving a safely inhabitable world ready to be colonized again. This tactic doesn't work particularly well against real people though, due to the presence of a relatively cheap device which can clean the plague from worlds and from ships carrying the plague. One of the more useful but more expensive items is the Transwarp Jump Drive. Simply turn it on, point to anywhere on the sector map, and you'll instantly be transported there at the cost of purple electron energy, not fuel. This lets you safely circumvent the red sector boundaries when present, and if you do this while cloaked, your opponents won't even know where you are until it's too late. And there's not really much more to say about the game. I should mention that there's a more modern version made for Windows 95 called Warpath 97, and it was released in 1997. But honestly, I prefer the Windows 3.1 original because the interface is more responsive, certain elements are larger, and because the AI isn't super aggressive. I mean seriously, in Warpath 97, the AI just immediately starts trying to mine systems and take over stuff in your own home sector, so you really don't have much of a choice other than to fight them really early in the game. And thus you can easily overtake them before you even get out of your own sector, really. That said, Warpath 97 also supports TCP IP and internet play, plus has a galactic map which is twice as large, so for epic 4 on 4 matches, that's definitely the one to go with. One last thing to note too is that the game has a mix of both digitized sound effects and OPL synthesized sound effects. Since the OPL sounds are being run straight through the OPL chipset, not through MIDI as one might expect given how Windows works, the synth sounds don't work on most modern systems. This primarily constitutes as engine sounds and a few other minor sounds. Virtually everything related to combat is digitized, so there's no worries there. But if you want to get the engine sounds on a modern system, you pretty much have to run the original release in Windows 3.1 through DOSBox. Though from what I understand, someone's been hard at work making a Windows 3.1 emulator. 
We have to check that out at some point. In any case, if you want to check out Warpath yourself, just head over to the Synthetic Reality website at www.synthetic-reality.com. You can also find a direct link for the Warpath page in the video description. Both the original Windows 3.1 release and the later Windows 95 release are available for download. And I should note, the Windows 95 release does indeed work all the way up to Windows 10 without any major issues. And that's all for this filler video. Next one will be in a couple Saturdays on December 3rd, and with any luck, I'll be ready with the filler I originally intended for today, so make sure you all stay tuned for that. Thanks for watching everyone, and special thanks to everyone supporting me on Patreon. Here's a small random set of you guys.